Welcome to Wilmer Beach Bible Study Wednesday night. And today is what? What is today? Prince Spaghetti Day. Prince Spaghetti Day. That's what you have for dinner? No, that's Wednesday. Today is Ash Wednesday. Now, I didn't grow up in a denomination that um, followed Lent. And Ash is the Day, Wednesday is the first day of Lent, but Lent is 40 days, right? But not including Sundays. 40 not days 40 before really? Easter, but not. Uh, well, you uh, no, you go do it on the you do it on the calendar. Really? You do really? it on the calendar. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, we're not 40 days from Easter. It's more than 40 days from Easter. Check it out. But uh, anyway, um, for our Devotional reading tonight, we're going to use Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. And since you went to parochial school <laughs> and knew what the day was, very clear, I'm going to let you read. And, and Kathy, you also, absolutely. I so I'm going to have you read uh, verse 9 to verse 11. And Kathy, you can read verse 12. Okay. We're in Mark chapter 1. Verse 9. One day Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart, and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved Son, and you bring me great joy. Kathy, verse 12 and 13. 12. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. All right, so Lent, 40 days. And um, did you see anybody today with ashes in their forehead? No. Oh, yeah, I did not. I today. saw a very few people. I saw President Biden. I didn't really uh, see anybody today. So we got ashes somewhere. There are several ministers were over at the train station going ashes to go. Well, there were several churches that did that. And ashes to go. Yeah, so like you didn't have to go to a service. Camden, Middletown. Uh, but you could get ashes and then you would, uh, you know, it's uh, something that people would see on your forehead. But hopefully the idea was that you were repentant of sin before you took the ashes. Or well, you're on the train. Part of it, that's the idea. <laughs> Supposedly, the Don't idea. Judge it. But uh, it's normally also thought for the 40 days to be a period of denial, right? Denied something. Uh, which is, where did that come from? Well, Jesus was in the desert for 40 days, uh, and he was being, during that time, tempted by the devil. Um, one of the temptations was to turn uh, stones into bread. And uh, the round stones kind of look like if you've ever seen Middle Eastern bread, round bread. Uh, so if you hadn't eaten, I guess, for 40 days, uh, that would have been a quite a temptation. So, um, is, is anybody here going to give up anything for Lent? Anybody here thought about that, giving up anything for Lent? I see nobody here is... Denying themselves, taking. But you don't necessarily have to give something up. You you can you can just um, be kinder. Try not to lose your temper. So that's the classic. I'm telling Pastor not, just <laughs> not doing something. It's trying to also do something. Yeah. Yes. You know, watch your language. You know, don't be swearing and just. I thought maybe you gave up uh, a ring on one finger. There. Oh no. <laughs> Stop complaining. Stop complaining. Yeah. So it's not necessarily giving something up. It's just trying to do better in how you are. Right, better yourself. Become so more Christ. This was the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Yeah. He was baptized. Spirit sent him into the desert to be tempted. Uh, God didn't tempt him, but he allowed him to be tempted. Uh, but Christians observed Lent 40 days before Easter, uh, kind of at a time to maybe do some reflection or self-denial or whatever else. 
thinking as Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem, as he predicted, knowing that death awaited him there, he wouldn't, the type of death that he was going to experience. And so people were kind of entering into that spiritual, what Jesus maybe was dealing with and thinking about as he did that for us. He did that for us. And so that's why people, you know, deny themselves or put themselves in some, some kind of spiritual reflection uh, during 40 days of Lent and starts on Ash Wednesday, which is which is today, which is why we read Jesus' baptism and then sent by the Spirit out into the desert to be tempted 40 days. So let's open with prayer. Father, as we talk about uh, the Jesus' temptation, we think also about his uh, going to the cross as he went to Jerusalem knowing what lie ahead of him and the period of reflection that Lent is for, for many uh, Christians of different denominations. Uh, as we think of our world today, we think of the situation in our country, uh, situation in our families, our individuals, um, certainly a time of spiritual reflection uh, beneficial to individuals and certainly uh, if um, the church, if the people, following of Jesus Christ would indeed t take this seriously and uh, would spiritually reflect on renewal in their lives. Uh, certainly something that would be a good thing, a positive thing. Um, so we pray for our, ourselves during this time and for our witness. And we ask this all in Christ's name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're in the book of Revelation on Wednesday night. Thank you, Dave, for filling in last week. And as uh, the ladies here said, and... Uh, I watched on the, the live stream. Uh, did a good job last week. The conversation, discussion was around chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Revelation. The letters to the seven churches. The letters to the seven churches. So oh, as you're turning to... <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, but you guided the discussion. Uh, as you're turning to Revelation chapter 4 tonight, uh, I have two questions to ask you. One question actually is, has two parts to it. Uh, as you're turning there, the letters to the seven churches. Which, which of the letters, which church? Do you did you as you read that or reread it? Most you most appreciate you most. I won't say like. Do you most appreciate which letters? Did you most appreciate it, or you think that most, or do you think it's most fitting um, for the church today? Matthew, you were waving your hand there. Yeah. Which letter do you most appreciate, or you think is most appropriate? I think, you know, Dave put out a, a paper with the, you know, like these pros and cons of what they were, and... I forget which church it was that he couldn't find any really thing wrong with them. That's the church I really believe we should be. Which writing. church was that? I think it was Philadelphia. Yeah. Was it Philadelphia? There were two of them. There Smyrna was the other, I believe. Yeah, but you wrote it out. You you put it out. I'm like, this is the church. The two that still exist, right? Those are the two that still exist. That's what I'd like to see our church be. That because you know something. You could hear all the complaints he was making. He's going to spew you out of his mouth. He's going to do yeah, this. This is Laodicea, right? Yeah, you know what I mean? For it's like, so, like yeah. what well, so, we would so consider you know, like Philadelphia or Smyrna. Right. Okay. Anybody else? What, the letter, letter that you most like or you think is most appropriate? <laughs> well, hopefully it would be. Most appropriate would be Philadelphia because it's so obedient. I like that I'm going up in Lancaster, Philadelphia. It's an hour and a half away. <laughs> City of brotherly love. William Penn, uh, the Quaker, who was the father, founder of Pennsylvania. My family purchased 1,500 acres from Richard Penn, William Penn's son. So we go back 300 years in Philadelphia and uh, welcoming the Mennonites, peace-loving people, uh, Quaker William Penn, that's how we got here 300 years ago from Germany, Switzerland, and whatever else. So Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Also another city known for Ben Franklin, you know, 
one of the wise men of our beginning country. So, anybody else? A, a letter that you most liked, most appreciate. <laughs> yes, Lisa. I don't know if I'd say most liked. I really try to take these to heart. Or you took to heart. The letter you always take to heart. Took to heart. Well, for me, it was two of them. Two of them. The first one was the first one, which was... Ephesus. Because it's easy, well, in my life to defend the truth, but then, you know, it, it, that's not what it's about. You can get off track. Or they were a very good church. They were very active, but they, they had one issue. They forgot about their love. Yeah, they forgot about their first love. Yeah, so I had to work on that one for me. And also um, Laodicea, because, yeah. you know, we're wealthy. Sad, sad situation. I mean, wealth tends to the deceitfulness yeah. of riches. It does. You know, and it does. just, um, um, they were wealthy. They also, well, they were lukewarm. I don't lukewarm. know that, I don't know that I would consider myself necessarily lukewarm. But we like our coffee or tea hot and our cold drinks cold. <laughs> Nobody likes something lukewarm. Uh, if you ever needed to regurgitate, yeah, yeah, I think for uh, my... something lukewarm would help do that. <laughs> That's what that passage <laughs> okay. says. So for me, the fo what I focused on with that one was, you know, as Americans, we're pretty wealthy comparatively, and. So, and, you know, you just, there's a certain, um, and you get anesthetized or you get maybe a little arrogant without realizing it, you know. There's, I mean, these other people were poor, um, and some of them were, you know, being tortured, like the persecuted church, you know. Uh, are we really... These people didn't need anything. Right. So, and, and how do I feel about the persecuted church? I'm concerned, but... What do I really do about it? You know, I'm probably I'm a little comfortable, a little too comfortable to really. What am I really doing to help them? You know. Dave, what do you you, you have any of those letters that uh, you most liked or you think it most appropriate? That I most liked. <laughs> or, I mean, I think all of them have a little bit for us. Have something to say for it. And if you look at the modern church, <clears throat> you can see elements yeah. in each one of them. Okay. Um, what I'd like to be is Church of Philadelphia. Okay. I mean, obviously, you don't want God to say anything negative. <laughs> well, you're leading into my next question. My next question is if, if the Lord, and as you pointed out last week, it's all red letters, it's all letters in chapter 2 and 3 of them. Jesus, Jesus' words to John that were given to him. If, if Apostle John was living today and the Spirit gave John a vision and in that vision were the words of Christ to the church, to the church as of Milford, Connecticut. The churches of Milford, Connecticut, there are more than seven. Or of this particular church. Anybody want to get that brave? Well, let's. What, that's what, what, would, what, would, what would the Spirit say to John, words of Jesus, to the churches of Milford or of this church? Anybody want to? What would, the, what, would the, what would the Lord say to us today? About our church? Or, or of the churches in Milford? I would say he would say about our church. We have a beautiful love in this church for everybody. I think we're very near together in love. No, we are. I mean, all right, we have our disagreements, but you know what? But if, we love each other. But we love each other. And, and, and you know, we, we have we fellowship. We don't necessarily dot our eyes across our teeth. <laughs> right, you know what I mean? So we have like... Well, we have on the, big, on the big... Big skill, we have big love. issues, we love each other. We love yeah. each other. In fact, uh, I got to read something. I got a letter today from a, a gentleman that uh, was attending here last year. And unfortunately, as he says here, things have changed, so they haven't been able to come. But he said this. It's uh, been wanting to get in touch with you since the beginning of January. It's now mid-February. He mentions the name of the lady that was attending with him. 
Uh, we've enjoyed Sunday worship at Wilmer and have met many wonderful spiritual men and women in our short time there. He says, I once heard it said, if you want to make God smile, tell him what your plans are. That's true. Life circumstances have changed uh, the direction of our plans uh, of being at Milford on Sunday mornings. Not in foresee of a future going to happen. So, mm -hmm. not able to attend, but uh, just wanted to send us a scrap of paper with the signature on. But uh, I thought that was nice. Uh, and I will definitely drop in my notes back and say we miss seeing you. Um, and uh, his lady that was coming with him, Vietnamese, and her mother came several times, a Vietnamese lady. I'm always impressed with the Vietnamese people I meet. Do not resent Americans for the Vietnam War. That, to me, is remarkable, what uh, the Vietnam War affected that country, how it affected that country. Uh, but they're just sweet. And you, and from time to time, you buy something in a store that's made in Vietnam. Right. You know. So anyway, um, they met a lot of wonderful people here, and I do think you're right about that. We have a good, a good spirit. So that mm -hmm. I think hopefully that would be one thing. We there's usually in the letters words of commendation, and sometimes there's words of condemnation. But I think that would be some words of commendation. Mary, you got anything to add to that? What would the, what would the spirit say? to our church today, this church. To this church. To this church. Forget the other six churches in Milford. <laughs> to this church. Or if you want to say something to the other six, some of those other six churches, you can do that too. Well, I mean, even though uh, we, we, we're, we are a loving church and yet we do have our arguments and we do have our differences, but that's just like our own within our own immediate families. We have that. So, but do say, do say. And but you and Greg sometimes have well, uh, <laughs> for, for almost forty-four 40 some years of marriage. Forty-two years, yeah. Okay. So um, I understand. Been married yeah. fifty years. I understand. But you know, we also have our poverty and our suffering, and sure. but and we support each other in that, and we don't give up on the faith. We stay faithful. We remain hopeful. We have some people um, going through some very difficult things. Yes. Some have gone through it before. Some are now going through some yeah. things and we support each other. And we, and we support each other. Yeah. Yes, just, just a little segue from what you said about where we have our differences sometimes. Yeah. I just was listening tonight to Fox News and they were talking about woke culture where you can't disagree. If you disagree, you well, are, you can't disagree you, with them. Right. They can or disagree you, with us. They right. disagree with us, but we can't disagree with them. They will attack you. They it's will like on, crash uh, you. Connection and on so, LinkedIn, where somebody says, "I think people talking, bringing up God in their faith, and that should be just in their churches and in their family. It shouldn't be in this forum." Well, you ever hear of freedom so of speech? Yeah, freedom right. of speech. Yeah. Yeah. So the only point well, is, you Christians just keep your faith to yourself and in your churches and whatever. But you know, but they meanwhile, their philosophies and whatever else. Yeah, their faith, yes. Right. So the think. point being that when they're the, the the good side of conflict, not that we like it, is that it's um, how do I want to put? It? Well, we have the freedom to truly express our real feelings. And that's healthy. And, and, and thinking all that, it's nice to be able to do that, but God gave us two ears and one, and one tongue. tongue. We need to listen. Yeah. And that's the one thing where, you know, I used to say to the village, uh, we need to have a seminar on listening. Uh, even when people are talking, they, they, they wait until somebody, they can jump in. Sometimes they don't even wait to jump in. They, so they didn't in. hear anything else that was said. They need to. Yeah. And they just want to make their points rather than, than listening. And, and listening for, for understanding, understand. I'm going to go out on a limb and, and say. I'm on a limb. This should be good. <laughs> Our church has some elements of the Church of Philadelphia. We also have some elements of the Church of Ephesus, and I think the pandemic really <clears throat> brought that out mm -hmm. in a lot of people who mm -hmm. quit coming and have walked away from their first love. So they kind of use the threat of the pandemic or the scare of the pandemic to put church in their back pocket. To put, to, yeah, and, and the 
that's one reason why, I mean, I didn't tell people they had to come. I didn't tell people to stay at home. I said, we're here. And if you, obviously, if you're not well, stay home. Okay. Uh, but, uh, and our attendance obviously dropped off just about in half. Uh, but we stayed open and we continued to be the church. We continued to do all the things that, that we that do as the church. Some of these big hallelujah church services that, uh, you know, where people have, you know, thousands of people and now they have nobody coming and their income went off and they had to, like, lay off staff and whatever. But they really weren't doing stuff that church is supposed to be doing. They were just big, big hallelujah services. Uh, so we kept being the church in that time. Yeah. And there were people for maybe a couple weeks, you didn't see them, but then they came back and, you know, we were able to, uh, and, and we, um, we didn't stop singing and praying and praising and all these things. We just were using some common sense. And I think what was positive from that is those who are still here, yeah. <clears throat> it's become a stronger church. Yeah. Um, I think we've moved more toward yeah. that model of the yeah. Philadelphia church. We haven't quite got back to where our tenants was then, but we did 200 shoeboxes this past year. We did. Year. Most we ever did. Uh, and we supported the relief in Ukraine. And uh, Paul says we have nine months of uh, cash reserves. Uh, that uh, And we've had enough funds to do the men's lounge. And uh, now we're looking to do the So a lot of good still going on, even though our tennis has been knocked down a little bit and we haven't gotten totally back there. Uh, and um, that... Uh, is, I think, a sign of God's faithfulness. People were being faithful, and God was being faithful to the people. And I think he would commend us for, for our faithfulness. And uh, at the same time, uh, be a word of encouragement to those that apparently across the country, you saw those things and uh, that, that uh, you know, 25, 30% of a lot of churches where people just aren't going to church anymore. They've just gotten mm -hmm. bedside Baptist and the Holy Spirit to comfort her near Oh, I just got cut comfortable, not not coming, get, not getting up on Sunday morning, and uh, coming to worship. Uh, easy. But uh, <laughs> Hebrew says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Why? Because we need to spur each other on, encourage each other on. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not only those that show up, but as you look around, you see people, you, faces you didn't see in a little while to uh, get on the phone, send my note, whatever, encourage them as well. We need to spur people on. And we're all like, uh, you ever try to start a fire or keep a fire going with just a log? You burn off the bark and that's it. It goes out. The kindling and bark. And, but if you get a couple logs, you get a bonfire going. Because it's reflecting off of each other. And that's what, why we need to get, get together. And why we need worship and to come together and encourage each other. Because life is pretty tough. Uh, even here in Southern Connecticut... Uh, 95 is the worst road in the country and people have to travel back and forth although one thing during the pandemic a lot of people weren't having to go to the office uh, and a lot of people moved out here from New York and whatever else uh, but uh, this life is uh, life is very challenging but then when you look at the other places in the world I mean Turkey and Syria this had another something six something on aftershock uh, I stopped and saw the people up at the uh, the New Market Deli here, and uh, uh, while they have relatives in Damascus, he said even in Damascus they felt the effects there, and buildings were with cracks in them and whatever else, mm. uh, and that. So you, you think the, the that horrible natural disaster, you think of the war that's still going on in Ukraine. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm very troubled about the situation in Ukraine. I don't hear anybody. I don't hear. Anybody calling for peace or right. attempting to intervene for peace or to cause a sensation of hostilities. I hear war weapons. I hear, you know, hardline and all that. And you think that's the way to get to uh, a victory is, is more war, more weapons. The UN is a totally wasteful bunch of people. Yes. Yeah, the UN is a debating society which is incapable because you got a couple people that are on the security council they can just block things 
we've done it at the same time ourselves. So the UN is, is, is totally wasteless for what it's supposed to do. Uh, and uh, I haven't heard the Pope say anything much. Who else, I mean, would you would say would be calling for trying to do something for peace? Or at least just getting a, a ceasefire mm -hmm. and getting people together to, to talk about peace. Well, I do. He was bring from bringing more weapons, another half a billion dollars or whatever. So I mean, I understand. I understand from a military standpoint the point they're trying to make, but at the same time, I don't hear anybody trying to work for peace. And uh, I, I just it, it troubles me. It troubles me. I hate war. I think war is a horrible thing. Uh, you see these poor people that uh, are victims of it, and they're having to live. In, in situations like that, it's just just horrible. Um, the situation on the southern border—it's wherever your views of immigration are. Uh, our country has failed to come up with a sensible immigration policy. What's going on there is inhumane and unsafe. I think everybody's got to agree on that: inhumane and unsafe. Where is this? The southern border. Mm -hmm. Oh God! Inhumane and unsafe. So mm -hmm. we're we're not in. The Ukraine, we're in Turkey, we're not on the southern border or those towns. Uh, so we do have some, we all have challenges in life. Um, we do have challenges in life, but we have obviously the fellowship of the, of the spirit and brotherhood and sisters in the church and uh, the blessings that basically a peace and prosperity here that most of the people don't have. And so we're grateful for that, but our, our hearts and our prayers uh, go out for those other very troubled places in the world, uh, persecuted church and across all the northern part of Af Africa, in Nigeria and whatever else, and, and other parts in the Middle East. That's very much a uh, true thing. So, uh, let's get to chapter 4 of Revelation. We're going to uh, leave the scene here on earth and we're going to move the vision is going to be of heaven. We're going to leave Earth and the church age, and we're going to be brought to heaven and what is depicted as the throne. And the one that's there on the throne, as well as the other surrounding things that John experienced. Um, John was given this vision. By the way, have you ever been? You ever, ever saw something, experienced something, and then you, now we're trying to explain what you saw or experienced to somebody, but you were just, words fail you and how to describe it. For instance, were you ever on the rim of the uh, Grand Canyon and you're trying to explain to somebody what, what you saw? Um, or a, a place I've been, the Taj Mahal in India, trying to explain to people that one of the wonders of the world, that building, Taj Mahal. Or even and, a sunrise. Hmm? A sunrise. Or a sunrise. Yeah, do tell me about so, <laughs> We have a picture over here. A picture is worth a thousand words. So you gotta paint. <laughs> but you ever, you ever been involved with something and then you're, now you're trying to tell somebody? I wasn't at Woodstock, but the Kathy talks about <laughs> she didn't get to go to Woodstock. She wanted to go to Woodstock, but uh, you, you can see uh, the pictures yeah. of it, and it just looked like a muddy, muddy mess and a whole bunch of inconveniences that I wouldn't have been interested in, even if it was a free rock concert. Uh, my idea of roughing it was staying at the Holiday Inn, not the Hilton. Uh, so I wouldn't have been attracted to that. I've, I've been to Bethel Woods, yeah. and it's just phenomenal. Well, it is today. To this, because it's, it's back just, to nature. Yeah, but you could just you could stand on the stage, and you you just say to yourself, "There was a half a million people out there." Can you imagine that? Could you imagine? People. Could you imagine? Janis Joplin stood here. Jimi Hendrix was Played here. Played the guitar. Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young were here. Santana was here. Jefferson Airplane was here. And out here. We had a half a million people. It's just... Well, yeah. anyway, John was given the you task. Yeah. Uh, he was given this vision, but now he's trying to put in words what he saw. What he saw. And the whole 
you got to see so much symbolism in the book of Revelation. Some of it is explained and some of it is not. And the symbolism that's not explained uh, is uh, given in words, but it's, it's there to depict something that John saw and experienced. So we all got Revelation chapter 4. Okay. We'll go around the room and read a couple verses. Um, and you can announce the verses that you're reading. I'm going to start off uh, with the first couple. Okay. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And after this was the depiction there on earth and of the churches. And you remember the lampstands, the churches, and the Christ is seen as among the lampstands. So that, that was there on earth. So now he's being caught up and there's this open door and he hears his voice just like a trumpet. Come up here and I will show you what, what must take place after this. Very quick. Stephanie go first this time. Oh, we'll go this way around. All right, Stephanie. <laughs> yeah, I've been awful quiet, huh? Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Read. Well, at, at, at the end of where you said here after. Um, at verse 3. Your verse Yeah, three. but it it says here, in the future, on my Bible it says. Yeah. Does it say that in yours? It'll take place after this. Yeah, thereafter, after mine this. says. And then right across from that it says, in little teeny letters, in the future. In the future. In the future. Okay. I don't know if yours says that or not. But anyway, do you want me to go to three? Yes. Well, two, right? Two. It should be two, yeah. Two. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And this is three. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine. A sardine stone. I think I said that wrong. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. I'll go through to four. Okay. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Wendy. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder. And in front of the thro throne were seven lampshades with burning flames. They are the seven spirits of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass sparkling like crystal. Okay. Keep going? Yes. In the center and around the throne were four living beings each covered with eyes, front and back. The first of these living beings had the form of a lion. The second looked like an ox. The third had a human face. And the fourth had the form of an eagle with wings spread out as though in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered with eyes, inside and out. Day after day, and night after night, they kept on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. All right. Lisa, you're at verse 9. Okay. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, verse 10, the four and twenty elders fall down before him, that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before him, saying, verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Okay. So, chapter 4. We're beginning to talk about what is going to happen, what is to come. Verse 1 says, 
there's this open door. Can you think of another reference to a door in a previous chapter? Jesus said, I am standing the door. at the door and knocking. And the picture of that, if you've ever seen, Jesus there knocking at the door. The artist painted the door with no hinge, I mean, with no, no handle. handle. So it could only be open on the inside. All right. um, I pastored a church, my first church that I pastored was the Church of the Open Door. Westminster, Maryland, named after that very famous church in California, the Church of the Open Door. <laughs> Large church at the time, one of the mega churches back in the day um, in Los Angeles. I have to tell you a story about that, Church of the Open Door. As a young couple visited the Church of the Open Door, and I forget who was the pastor then, but he was a worldwide known Bible pastor, teacher. They had a couple thousand people in attendance. They had a choir of 300. Wow. <laughs> a choir of 300. Wow. 3,000 people in an auditorium. Um, and this couple came to visit. They had some children. They were <clears throat> sent downstairs to the nursery. And the nursery was in a, a fairly small room. And they had like these double-decker cribs. You ever see in a nursery? Mm -hmm. Double-decker cribs. After the service was over, they came back to collect their children. And the people said, I hope you were perplexed by Dr. So-and-so's sermon. Yes, I hope that we're inspired by the choir. Yes, I hope that you'll come back. And they said, probably not. Probably not. Why is that? I said, well, you know, our children are our most valuable. You know, and this is really not the most, you know. Child-friendly. Child-friendly thing. You know who that couple was? Yes. Mr. and Mrs. Walt Disney. Oh. Mr. and Mrs. Walt Disney. Can you imagine the impact on the church had Mr. and Mrs. Walt Disney stayed in that church? Think about that. So that's uh, when I was, went to Grace. I got there. You could count on your hand and have some fingers left over the number of children we had. We had this little nursery. I said, no, no. If we're gonna reach a young couple, we gotta we gotta start with the nursery. First thing I did here, we needed a nursery. And right when you walk inside, well, we have a little chapel. This is a little chapel. We didn't need another little chapel. We needed a nursery that you know that says to people, young people, young couples, uh, that this church, but children are important. Okay. Uh, so the church of the open door. That was the, the church I passed in Maryland, named after that church in California. Uh, which unfortunately um, doesn't exist anymore. And uh, they had this big neon sign, Jesus saves. Uh, I forget the guy's name that took it over. Eventually, uh, he was on uh, Gene Scott. Gene Scott. Anybody ever see oh, yeah. Doctor Gene Scott? <clears throat> Late night TV. Yeah, he was on. He was on TV, and he would uh, he would do teachings, and then he'd say, okay. I'm not doing any more teaching until you send in money. When you send in money, because you know it takes money, it takes money to be on the air. You send in, and I actually had a counseling situation once. Where a couple came, to me, and the issue was the husband watched that guy all the time and sent all their money to him. It was creating a problem. That was so I, you know, I think I was an interesting person to watch every now and then, but to watch him. For hours on end and to send, you know, that was, anyway, Dr. Dean's got interesting. He smoked a uh, CR, right? You remember him, Dave? Yeah, I do. He was a character. He was a character. Let me tell you that preaching is true through really personality. He certainly was a personality. So anyway, uh, on our website and a picture of our church, uh, when they did a picture of the church, I said, uh, open the, have the door, church doors open. The church door open, uh, and so it just it looks like something dark there. But when you look closely, the doors are open. So it's the idea is that we're we're open, we're we're welcoming a, a people. Okay, uh, here he says, I saw a door standing open, and there's this voice. Now here's a voice, and, and so what's what about a voice? A voice that sounds like a trumpet. A trumpet is like an instrument, but. The, uh, uh, a 
trumpet is a pretty uh, strong uh, note. It gives a pretty strong note, kind of like a bugle or a trumpet, whatever. And so he's trying to describe this voice. So he says it sounds like a trumpet, but uh, you know, what is it? how does a trumpet sound? Well, a trumpet is a very clear, strong signal. Okay, so I don't think it necessarily sounds exact. Not that I know it's a trumpet, but you know, when you think of a trumpet, it's a very clear, strong signal. Okay, uh, and he says, I was in the spirit. Same thing that was said in chapter one of being in the spirit. Um, and we're talking there, I think, about experiencing the fullness of the spirit. The Bible tells us how we are to be filled with the spirit, and it's a continual filling of the spirit because why we're we're leaky vessels we're leaky vessels you know your car gets a lot of miles on it after a while you keep parking the same spot you notice the oil on there and you gotta like after a while in between oil changes check the oil because the engines after a period of time the gaskets and water start to leak well we're leaky we're leaky uh beings and it comes to uh with sinful nature on it so we need a, a refilling of the spirit so he was in the spirit um, in worship and, and uh, being in the spirit, being had to, he was experiencing the fullness of the spirit. Okay, um, and there before him he sees a throne. Now I'm talking about when you attempting to depict something. When most people think about heaven, what are some things when you talk about heaven that conjures up in your mind? Heaven. Clouds. Clouds. <laughs> Go up in the air, good clouds. Angels. Angels. Uh, kind of a Moses looking fellow sitting there with a white beard uh, and, uh, on this like a throne chair, whatever. Uh, so uh, here he sees a th he sees a throne. But he says the one that's on the throne had an appearance as Jasper and, and there's uh, Next word is he's going to use in, in the book of Revelation a number of gemstones, and this one is thought to be a, a kind of a ruby or gemstone. Uh, and you can have d different translations of what it is. Uh, Carmelium is what my translation says. So you got any other? That's what mine says. Okay, so it's a uh, uh, jasper, any particular favorite. Color is jasper to you? I don't know what color jasper is. It's it's a, Google it, right? There's a bluish, I believe, uh, a bluish uh, tint to it. Uh, but it's more of a translucent uh, bluish uh, tint. But what does what like it say there? Hmm? Like a topaz. Like it's sort of like a topaz, and there's different shades of topaz. But uh, So there's a throne. And the one on the throne has this appearance of jasper, and so it's. Find it yet, Lisa? What's that? Did you find it yet? Well, I'm looking at jasper, and it's saying, <laughs> it's uh, kind of it says most commonly red, but maybe yellow, brown, green, or rarely blue. So it sounds pretty. So there's a couple <laughs> different. It's a number of different colors. I say blue. Not I say too, blue. Uh, but the other color there is uh, carmelian. It is a, also a reddish, a reddish. Okay, but what's that's interesting next is it says the rainbow, resembling emerald. Now I certainly know what emerald. Emerald is a beautiful darker green, and by it's very expensive, very expensive stone. My birthstone. Boat your birthstone. That means your birth is May. Okay, I have to tell you a story about this. So on one of my trips to Israel, it was one of my diplomatic trips, uh, I didn't have a group of people with me, we had a bunch of different meetings, and uh, when I was over in Bethlehem, went to the store that we often uh, did some shopping with, uh, he was a cousin of the mayor of Bethlehem, which sort of was my in to, to the mayor, um, and I said, I need to bring something back for the family, you know, as soon as I got inside the door, the kids were, you know, what is daddy, would you bring back to, uh, I got. I had a ring made for my wife, and it was a mother's ring. And um, nice. her birthday and our daughter's birthday is January. 
January. Garnet. Garnet. And garnet is kind of an Indian stone, but it's a reddish, reddish. reddish it has a little brown tint, but a reddish. Emerald, my son's birthday in May, so I had two of the garnets with the Emerald. Emerald in the middle, and of course I was representing the gold that's holding them all together. <laughs> so I had this ring made up, wow, and when cool. I gave her that, she's watching it tonight. It's one of the few things I ever gave her that her, her mm -hmm. mouth fell open. <laughs> it's happened recently again. It recently happened again. <laughs> okay, but okay, so it, I know what emerald is. Emerald is a beautiful green stone. But it says here the rainbow. It's a, there's this rainbow resembling emerald. Now, say that a rainbow has all these different colors in it. But what what do you when you think of a rainbow? What else do you think about? It's the shape of the, the rainbow. The shape of it. The arch. The bow. I've been down here at at, uh, at in the evening, and I've seen a <clears> rainbow, <throat> and so the rainbow is. Over there, and it goes over there. So I get in the car and I start driving. driving. Never get to where the bottom of the rainbow is. Or that no. pot of gold. The pot of gold, yeah. <laughs> Irish. Uh. Coming up. St. Patty's Day coming <laughs> up. Yes. The pot of gold. So <laughs> it, it moves, but uh, it's depending upon the light, and there's got to be certain moisture. Yeah. I had a funeral recently <clears> over in, in West Haven. And when we come out, over... Over West Haven and, and right over the funeral home was this emerald. I mean, it was this uh, rainbow. It was this rainbow. And everybody said, that's a sign. It's a, it's sign. a sign. You know, he's okay. It's he's sign. okay. It's, it's a, a sign. Rainbow. Guys, it's a promise. Sign. But uh, emerald, it says it's, so to me it's the shape here. The rainbow is the shape, but it's the color is emerald. You got that? Yep. So he's trying to describe what he's seeing. He sees this throne. And the different colors of the throne, you know, there's blue or red, green, and the rainbow, and, and the rainbow, and uh, this individual seated on the throne. But then, around the throne, are 24 other thrones. Now, obviously, they're smaller thrones, but they're 24 thrones. So, when you Google, what are the 24 thrones in Revelation 4? You can get a difference of opinions on that. Let me give you my opinion. And then you can share me what your opinion is. The 24. It's not really explained that this is 24. And it gives a description of what these people were wearing. They're called the 24 elders. So that's kind of a hint. 24 elders. Uh, they're dressed in white. And they've got their crowns of gold and uh, on their head. And they've got these uh, flashes of lightning and all that. So, the easiest thing to me is to say that 24 are representatives of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. All right. That's, to me, uh, the simplest 12 and 12, 24 of what the 12 thrones are. Well, <clears throat> the symbolism of that would be who's going to be in heaven? The Jews. Israel. And the saved, who through the apostles' witness. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I agree. I, that's, I had some of those say it was no, it was just they're all Christians. They has to all be believers. But I see it as the twelve representatives of the twelve tribes of Israel and the, the twelve apostles. That's that's my. You have your opinion about the twelve, but there's these twenty-four thrones. I think they're lesser thrones, but there's these, they're surrounding the throne and the one that's seated on the throne. Uh, and then there's the seven spirits of God. And if you notice a reference to it, it goes back to chapter 4, verse 1, where it talks about, and we had this discussion, what are the seven spirits or sevenfold spirit? <laughs> Wisdom, so understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. And and you remember what I said about that in chapter one, verse four. First of all, it talks about eternal God. It talks about eternal God, and it talks then about the sevenfold spirit, and then about Jesus Christ. So to me, this is a reference to the Holy Spirit, and seven, a uh, very prominent number in the Bible, especially in the Book of Revelation, of perfection. So I see this as uh, uh, 
the reference to the Holy Spirit. And wisdom, understanding, counsel, <laughs> fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. So your teachers will be proud of you. <laughs> Remember. <laughs> so Sister I, I, I see this as a the seven spirits or sevenfold spirits is a is a reference here to the Holy Spirit. That's what I see. Okay. Um, and it says before the throne there was uh, like a sea of glass clear as crystal have you ever been down here at the beach when it's totally smooth mm -hmm. no. totally there's not a ripple there's no waves no wind just totally smooth like a mirror yep. yeah. Yeah. yeah and so that's how I see what, what was seen there this is like a sea of glass. <clears throat> okay. Now, next interesting thing. <clears throat> it says, in the center, around the throne, were these four living creatures. They're living creatures. They're not like statues or something, but these are four living creatures. Can I go back to <clears throat> the sea of glass first? Yeah, second? back to the sea of glass. Sure. <clears throat> if you can imagine the, the scene, here's these. 24 elders and peals of lightning, thunder, all this commotion, and yet here's this smooth, sea of light. untouched sea. Yeah. Good point, good point. I so skipped over the flashes of lightning and The, the, all the that. domain that God had yeah. over everything, that this yeah. can all be going on yet. But here's this sea of glass. Good point. Thank you for that. Yes. Okay, so... There's these four living creatures. They're living creatures. Very interesting. You can go, what were the four living creatures in Revelation chapter 4? And you can get our opinions on that. So you're going to hear my opinion on this, okay? But you're going to notice these uh, four living creatures, it said they were covered with eyes in the front and the back. Now that tells me that they are aware of everything that's happening around them. You know, you see predators, they got the eyes looking this way. You see animals that are the victims of predators. Their eyes are on the side. A rabbit, for instance, the eyes are on the side. The hawk that's in my backyard, his eyes are on the front. These eyes are all around. So they're seeing 360 degrees. Everything going on the front and one on the back. Nothing misses what's their attention. Nothing misses their attention. I'll come back to that in a minute. These four living creatures. They're aware of everything. They see everything. Okay? Um, one was like a lion. And that's the king of the jungle, right? King of the, the interesting thing about the king of the jungle, he lays around. A big cat sleeps 20 hours a day. I have a little cat. And a little cat. And he sleeps 20 hours a day. He frown all night. But the, the king of the jungle, you know who does the honey? It's the, it's the female lion. They're out going to catch, feeding the little ones, and here comes the big guy. He comes over. Just like home. Just like, just like home. But the, the king beast of the, I'll never forget, our, our pastor in the early 50s went to Tanzania, missionary work, and when he came back in 1956, he brought back slides of, Tanzania in 1956, thatch huts and lions and tigers and elephants. And I, I wanted to be a return missionary. <laughs> that sounds pretty exciting. But you got to go, first of all, to be a return missionary. <laughs> all right. Um, so a lion. A lion King. The Lion King, the movie Lion King. Has anybody seen the play, the movie The Lion King? Mm -hmm. All right. Lion King. Uh, the next one is a, an ox. Uh, you might have another word for an ox, but it's uh, like a bull or uh, we'd say what's a like a big uh, cow, buffalo, you know, like a, an ox. Okay. Uh, the next, the third one is his face like a man. Did anybody ever we notice that some people's uh, pets start to look like them and they start to look like their pets? <laughs> No, no reference here to the doggy, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. But uh, this creature here had a face like a man. Okay, uh, 
And the third, that's the third, the fourth was like a flying eagle. You know we have eagles again in Connecticut. Yes. Wow. We do. And, yeah, uh, yeah, they show up here. We got the you know, the other, uh, what's the other uh, kind of a eagle-like bird, the uh, osprey. Yeah. But they got eagles here, especially up along Route 8, yeah. along the river, yeah. whatever else. And, uh, you know, eagle, uh, national bird is the eagle. Yeah. You know, there was a there was some discussion of what should be, and, and some thought it should be the turkey. Yeah, heard that. Yeah, some thought, but I'm glad they picked the eagle. Yes. Okay, we got the eagle. So, eagle, uh, magnificent bird. Big, and it got golden eagles, whatever, but the big wind spray. Uh, it right. nest on and it got that, you know, whole lot. It was nest on Buckingham yeah. Avenue, which yeah. is awesome. They just built a new nest at Laurel and Hall yeah. in the middle of the yard there for another. Oh, really? Yeah. So I heard. And uh, after 9 11, you saw a lot of things that had, you know, eagle was very prominent uh, on that as well. Okay, so here's these four living creatures. Lion, ox, face like a man, and an eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. Six wings, and that's sort of a hint. Um, and uh, covered with eyes all around again. Eyes front and back, eyes all around. Now, Ezekiel, cherubs, an angel. And they're uh, they're a, uh, the elite of the angels, guardians. Only in Ezekiel it was like four when you hear it said six ones. But uh, it's thought that these creatures were guardian angels. They're guarding around the throne, always seeing everything going on. And the, the wings are kind of like I say. Uh, you see a reference there. I think of the angels or cherubims. And the responsibility that as God has created them up there of uh, protection, or of watch, or watch. Any other thoughts on the four creatures in Revelation 4? Well, the wings, seen around the throne. The wings, I believe, six is significant. They could go forward, backwards, mm -hmm. up and down, side to side, so they could go everywhere. Sort of like this aircraft that. Lift up and fly. Right, they're not limited <laughs> like a bird. To, right. It could go every go which every direction. <clears throat> and I think the what they what he names as the four living creatures have significance. The lion is like the, the top hierarchy of wild beasts. Yeah. In, in Africa especially. Anywhere. Yeah. Wild beasts. The ox is like the at that time the High, top hierarchy of strength. domesticated strength beasts. So yep. every but every beast that they used for plowing and, and whatever. Bird bird bearing. Right. Then you had mankind. Bird. Yep. And then the eagle, which represents, I think, just basically everything else. So that that's how I view the four, four creatures. But they're they're cherubs. They're angels. Yeah, they're not they're not an eagle, a lion. But they, and they're they not, they're not the, the same as the elders that were on the throne, right. but they're there in a, in a form of protection, guarding guarding the throne. But they're also doing something else, are they not? They never stop saying, holy, holy, holy. Remember that song, holy, holy? Mm -hmm. I remember playing that on the mandolin. Mr. Mooney was my teacher, the Scottish guy. And yeah, yeah, we used to play the mandolin. When are you going to play in church? Um, you know, Steve Steve Salka gave me a mandolin, one of his, because I had two mandolins. I gave them to somebody in Maryland, never got them back. One was acoustical, and one was electric. Uh, and then Steve had one. I was gonna, you know, I said, hey, just never got around to it. You know, arthritis, you know, whatever. But just never got around to. Uh, uh, banjo is also a four string. If you can play a mandolin, you can play a four string banjo there because they're, they're four strings. But mandolin has four double strings. Or double mm -hmm. Gotta have some ca calluses all yeah. through. Yeah. So I remember playing this song, Holy, Holy, Holy. Okay. Is the Lord Almighty who was, is, and who is to come. Remember those references in chapter one about God and also said of, of Jesus Christ? So what is said of Jesus is also said of, uh, of the Almighty who was, who is, and is to come. 
the eternalness of God. Whatever the living creatures, whatever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks, glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. And this is the uh, this is the picture here of Jesus. The 24 elders, they all fall down before him, the one who sits on the throne, and worship him, the one who lives forever and ever. That's Jesus. And then they lay their crowns at his throne. Remember that the musical group, Casting Crowns? Remember mm -hmm. that? That's a yeah. pop group, right? Christian group. Uh, the crowns, we're not going to... We have crowns, we get jewels, we get rewards, okay? Um, we're not going to be praying around heaven with our crowns. We're going to cast them at the feet. Of, at the, this is what's going on here, okay? And they are saying, as they lay their crowns before him, you are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And then Colossians says that Jesus was the agent of creation. So I think that's, this is a reference to indeed, uh, the Lord God, Jesus himself. And uh, the, worship that is, the worship that's taking place there in heaven, as John is seeing, he's describing what he's seeing as he is given a vision of heaven. Now this is chapter 4. Uh, this chapter is, you know, you can read, there's a lot of symbolism, but I think we get, we get the picture of what John has shown in the beginning. Now we're going to get into some, a lot of other symbolism as we go through. It's going to get a little bit more challenging next week, chapter 5. So I encourage you to be reading that and reading maybe even more than just a, a chapter or so ahead. But, uh, and read, I would encourage you to read it in several different translations because just like tonight, we, there's a little bit of difference in that. And sometimes you just some slightly different wordings and a uh, choice of words gives you a little bit fuller understanding. I wanted to say something. I just, um, one thing I'm, because I'm learning while I'm doing this, um, like here, it's up in heaven, and then what comes after is going down on earth. And even the first chapter showed the Ancient of Days, Christ up kind of in his glory, and then it went the letters to the angels, to the churches on earth. And it just, this is just my take. To me, because um, the things that are happening as I'm reading, they start in heaven. And then like, an, you know, God is giving like an order or something. But it starts first with the Lord. And, and, and he's seated there in the throne and you can see his, uh, him in judgment. And seated on the throne in, in control of what's going to happen. Yes. But even like here, it's this seems to me to be worship. I don't see any judgment here. Well, it's, it's overwhelming. It's all worship. I, mean, I it's hope all as, worship. as we gather to worship that we have that sense of awe that we're worshiping God, <clears throat> Jesus Christ, the one who lives forever, holy, holy, the one who's created the sustainer of everything. everything. Yeah. yeah. I just I one before before studying this I started I would feel afraid because to me it was you read all the terrible things coming up and it's just like so much random awful chaotic scary stuff okay but I know it's the Bible and I know you get a blessing and you should read it but what I see here more is well first of all it's more controlled. It's not out of control. God is not out of control. Like like when he sent the letters to the seven churches, he was in total control. He gave exact... Well, he, knew, he knew them. He, he walked among them. And so what he was saying was very appropriate. He was, knew them. Right. And he was seen there among them. Right. And even here, now we see him in the heaven in his abode and being worshipped. And then the next stuff. And he's going. on the throne. Right. He's on the throne. And then now it's going to be coming down. The elders judgments. are worshiping him. The cherubs are protecting in there. But that's well not out of control him. at all. Yeah. Right. That's, that's, I guess, which it just gives me hope. 
and it gives me security because, you know, I mean, I tend to believe, I don't fully believe I'll, I'll leave in the rapture before the tribulation. I want to, and I'm, but I'm not convinced. Well, I but, think, remember the whole, the book of Revelation was written to be an encouragement to Christians in the first century as down through the centuries. The whole book of Revelation is meant as a word of encouragement. But it has to encourage you to be encouraged. Yeah. So, but I, I just one thing I see more. God is in control. Is he's totally in control. And, and I think when, I see one other thing here. It's going to show an awful lot of horrible stuff. It's going to yeah. happen. This is the assurance that we get as Christians before all that stuff is revealed. And I think the the perfect symbolism of it is the rainbow. Just as God promised not to flood the earth again. I think, and we may disagree on this, I think he's promising to Christians, you're not going to go through all this stuff I'm going to show you. Let's hope. I mean, that's... No. But the rainbow is a promise. Well, the rainbow is a promise that I'm never again <clears throat> going to destroy the whole earth. By water. Right, by, by water. water. Yeah, but right. I think now it's <laughs> the Christians yeah. saying, I'm not mm -hmm. going to put you through all this, but, but here's what's mm -hmm. going to happen. He... He's in control. The whole the rainbow is an encouragement to us. Yes. It was meant to, that's how it was meant. Yes. All right, well let's close in prayer. Lord God, as we uh, have this depiction of heaven that John was able to uh, experience and see in the spirit, and the encouragement that, that it is for us today to know that you're on the throne that you're in control, and uh, the worship, that it, you're worthy of to receiving and being received. Um, that's what we endeavor to do in our, in our worship, and as we uh, have a sense of who you are, certainly uh, that's our natural response. We do pray for the world today. There's a lot of tribulation happening today in terms of just troubles with the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria continuing the war the wars that are going on especially in Ukraine the other issues of uh, division and problems even in our own country and uh, those uh, attempting to come here we pray as Christians that you might protect us, but also we pray that you might enable us to be a blessing. We ask that you might help us to be peacemakers, and especially in sharing the message of peace, of how people can have peace with you through the forgiveness of sins, the assurance of being your children through faith. And Lord, oh, and Lord I'd just like to lift up this um, custom around this little old lady <clears throat> I picked up last night. I would just like to pray for, you know, I built a little rapport with her through the ride, and at the end I felt like witnessing to her. Lord, and I witnessed to her, and she said she didn't want you. I just feel really badly that she said that. And she got out of the car, and that was it. But I just pray for her soul, Lord, that she will have listened to something I said and will have a change of heart and come to find you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I also pray for uh, my co-worker, Margarita. She requested prayer um, for her and her husband for protection. Um, uh, uh, they're getting attacked quite a bit and they're not provoking it in any way. So uh, we just ask for protection for them. Um, also, Lord... Um, and for her daughters. And also, Lord, I pray for salvation for my boss. Um, and Father, I, I just thank you for you. Uh, we also want to pray especially for our children and our congregation. And each family, God. And just children in general, Lord. Um, Father, but thank you that we, um, we know you. And that we have you in our lives. Lord, we ask you to be with us the remainder of the days of this week. And
bring us together again on Sunday with a note of anticipation. And may our worship be indeed uh, pleasing and honoring to you, encouraging and uplifting to uh, those that are gathering or coming in, being part of us. We thank you for those that are here visiting on Sunday. And uh, we just uh, thank you for evidence of your spirit in our midst and for the open door, door that's open to people that they might come and join us. And uh, join us in worshiping you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Glad you're with us tonight. Your assignment for next week, chapter 5, the book of Revelation. Thank